Chapter 20, A Final Journey. It was, if, it was as if a member, a member of the family had died. He had been a world-dominating figure for 12 years. Strong, witty, compassionate, able. Young people could remember no other president. The nation was in a state of shock. Those who had felt left out by government before, the poor and the disadvantaged, were especially grieved. This was a president who had done more than talk about fairness and opportunity. He acted to begin to make them a reality. And while he had broken precedent by running for office four times, he had not forgotten that a president, as president, he was servant of the people. He had never assumed kingly trappings. He had never lost his sense of humor or his easy informality. In warm springs, the flag-draped coffin began its long, sad train journey to Washington first, then to Hyde Park, where the president was to be buried. Sitting inside the train, Eleanor Roosevelt kept remembering a poem about Lincoln's death. It would leave her mind. It wouldn't leave her mind. A lonesome train on a lonesome track, seven coaches painted black, a slow train, a quiet train, carrying Lincoln home again. This poem Eleanor Roosevelt remembered was written by Millard Lample. At night, unable to sleep, she said, I lay in my berth with the window shade up, looking out at the countryside he had loved and watching the faces of the people at the stations and even at the crossroads who had come to pay their tribute, their last tribute all through the night. It was truly, I was truly surprised by the people along the way, not only at the stops, but at every crossing. In the train's press car, reporters looking out the window saw black sharecroppers on their knees, hands outstretched in prayer. As the train slowed in a, Carolina, a South Carolina city, members of a Boy Scout troop began singing, Onward, Christian Soldiers. Then other brothers joined in, and soon, according to one who was there, eight or ten thousand voices were singing like an organ. Everywhere people cried. The sobs continued as the coffin was carried by horse-drawn session through Washington to the White House. Then, during the memorial service, the whole grieving nation came to a halt and paid its respects. Airplanes sat on runways. Radios were silent. Telephone service was cut off. There was not even a dial tone. News services? Teletypes typed the word silence and went dead. Movie theaters closed, cars and trains and buses pulled to the curb. 505 New York subway trains stopped. Stores shut their doors. And everywhere, in other countries too, people put hands on hearts or fell to their knees or just stayed quiet. That day, newspapers carried no advertisements. Clearly, he had been a great president. But how great? What would history say of him? A poll of 50 leading historians soon ranked him just behind Lincoln and Washington as one of the three greatest presidents. Winston Churchill said that in world importance, Roosevelt was first. And yet, as much as some loved and respected him, others hated and vilified him. Later, historians would look at him through two lenses. As an effective president, they agreed. He was like a magnificent symphony conductor who knows all the notes and just what to do with them. No question about it. They all still agreed he was a great president. But there was something that bothered many. As a human being, he was sometimes less than great. His personality was flawed. It was too bad to have acknowledged it, but he could be devious. He could tell a person something and not mean it. He could tell a story that made him look good, but it wasn't quite true. 
Perhaps it was the tendency to always act as if everything was fine, even when it wasn't, that some found disturbing. He was used to pretending. It was both a strength and a weakness. Eleanor, who was more, than, more a partner than a wife, said, because he disliked being disagreeable, he made an effort to give each person who came in contact with him the feeling that he understood what his particular interest was. Often people have told me that they were misled by Franklin. This misunderstanding not only arose from his dislike of being disagreeable, but from the interest that he always had in somebody else's point of view and his willingness to listen to it. He listened intently, and that was flattering. People thought it meant that he agreed with them. He didn't tell them differently, so some felt he couldn't be trusted. But no one could take his achievements as president from him. They changed the nation. Here are the most important of them. He led the nation through two of its worst times, a depression and a world war, with gusto, courage, and an unfailing confidence. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. He was inspiring. He made people believe in their country and want to do their best for it. Perhaps only during that time, when the Constitution was written, were more brilliant thinkers attracted to government service. This generation has had a rendezvous with destiny. He believed in government for the people. During the Roosevelt administrations, social security, farm programs, aid for home buyers, aid for dependent children, and other caring programs were begun. He paid attention to laboring people in their needs. Some called it a revolution. Perhaps it was. It was in line with the tradition of revolution that could be traced to the ideas of Thomas Jefferson, Andrew Jackson, the populists, and the progressives. As we have recaptured and rekindled our pioneering spirit, we have insisted that it shall always be a spirit of justice, a spirit of teamwork, a spirit of sacrifice, and above all, a spirit of neighborliness. He strengthened the two-party system. Since before the Civil War, only two Democrats, Grover Cleveland and Woodrow Wilson, had ever been elected president. And Woodrow Wilson made it because the Republican Party was split. After Roosevelt, there was a better balance between the two parties. Here in the United States, we have been a long time at the business of self-government. The longer we are in, are at it, the more certain we become that we can continue to govern ourselves. That progress is on the side of the majority rule. That if mistakes are to be made, we prefer to make them ourselves and to do our own correcting. He brought new people into the government. He named a woman, Frances Perkins, to his cabinet. He began the process to include the excluded. Wartime America was a land that accepted much discrimination. We are going to make a country where no one is left out. He cared about the environment. He sent young people from the inner cities out to plant trees, and he worked to protect our nation's natural heritage. The conservation of our natural resources and their, pro and their proper use constitute the fundamental problem which underlies almost every other problem of our national life. The government has been endeavoring to get our people to look out ahead and to substitute a plan, an orderly development of our resources in place of a haphazard striving for immediate profit. We are prone to think of the resources of this country as, an, as inexhaustible. This is not so. By his personal example, he showed 
that for people with energy and intelligence, there's no need to be any such thing as a handicapped. If you have spent two years in bed trying to wiggle your big toe, everything else seems easy. He won the war and set the stage for the prosperity that was to follow. It might not have happened with another leader. In the future days, which we seek to make secure, we look forward to a world founded upon the four essential freedoms. The first is freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. The second is freedom of every person to worship God in his own way everywhere in the world. The third is freedom from want. The fourth is freedom from fear. Franklin Roosevelt remained committed to protecting basic freedoms, including freedom of speech as illustrated in this painting by American artist, Normal, Norman Rockwell. And this will be given to you in a different video. Have a great day, boys and girls.